you much for joining today's webinar. I'm Dr. Prachi from Shield Healthcare, and we are bringing episode U, which is all about uh, urogynecology. So A to Z series, uh, trending our series is brought to you by AGOG. So let us have a quick introduction of AGOG followed by a uh, prayer. वक्र तुंड महाकाय सूर्य कोटि सम प्रभ निर्विघ्नम कुरु मे देव सर्व कार्यशु सर्वदा It is my honor and pleasure to introduce uh, today's coordinators. We have Dr. Ruchika Garg with us. Ma'am is a professor at uh, SN Medical College, Aga. And uh, Dr. Tanushree Pandey Patkaukar. Ma'am is an obstetrician and gynecologist, laparoscopic surgeon, IVF specialist at uh, Dr. Patkaukar's clinic in Mosul. So with this, I hand over this session to our esteemed uh, coordinators. Over to you, Ma'am. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Prachi. So uh, today we are very lucky to start this session uh, of you series, which are uh, which is the brainchild of Dr. Komal Niranjan Chavan, who is the main convener for this um, webinar. So I am inviting Dr. Komal Chavan. She has so many awards to her credit. Uh, she is ex honorary professor R N Cooper Hospital, and she is the shining shining star of Foxy. Currently, we can find her in so many CMEs and she's spreading knowledge everywhere. She's also the chairperson of Foxy Med Medical Disorders in Pregnancy Committee till now. And she, uh, she ha has worked so many posts, including managing committee member of MOGS. And recently, she has won uh, MA Pandit and Shelja Pandit Women Empowerment Award and her Foxy Medical Disorders Pregnancy Committee also award, achieved um, God the Mehru Dara. Uh, best committee award and she has been uh, awarded the dheera foxy award and so many appreciation awards including thank the you. nari shakti tama so uh, over you. to kumal chavan ma'am welcome you ma'am um, uh, we also have the next convener respected dr niranjan chavan sir with us who is also the convener for this program she is holding he is holding so many posts he is the joint treasurer of foxy he, he just the, he was the president of MOGS and he's also the mem member of Oncology Committee of SAFOG. And he's dean and he's editor-in-chief of the this Academia Global Journal. And she has so many awards and publications to his credit. So I welcome Dr. Niranjan Chavan, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ruchika. I think uh, for the lovely introduction. And uh, I welcome all of you for this trending Ask the, Ask, Ask the Expert series. Today's episode, you, is focused to urogynecology. And we are in the end of our series. And uh, we had a real lovely time with this focus topics for Ask the Expert series. And a lovely uh, experience it has been coordinating this series and learning a lot of learning from all the pioneers and legends we have today. So today's talk is going to focus by SUI by Dr. J.B. Sharma. And we have overactive uh, bladder and SUI, all these topics and infections. And we have speakers, uh, Dr. J.B. Sharma, Dr. Aparna Hegde. I think they are really par excellence in their subjects. And what can I say about our chief guest and guest of honor? We have our legendary Madam Chandravati, Madam, who is going to be the chief guest and a urogynecology experienced person in his self, Dr. Vinish Mishra, who has joined as a guest of honor. 
So I take pleasure to invite Dr. Chandravati, Madam, and she is a professor in Emirates Department of Obstetrics and Dynac at PG Medical College, uh, Lucknow. She is a teacher par excellence. So many, so many uh, conferences she's uh, uh, she has organized, and I am really fortunate to be present at both her AICOG Lucknow conference and the memories are really, really so great. She's managing trustee of the Krishna Educational Foundation at Lucknow, secretary NGO Wheel, Women Empowerment, and the patron of ICMCH, NARCHI, LOGS, so many organizations, a vice president of Foxy, UP chapter of OBGY in Lucknow, governing council member of ICOG and peer reviewer of Jogi Journal and Madam, uh, I think has the most respectable person in North India. And we really have to learn lots from her, how to carry it out for this all over so many years she has been doing this and she's an inspiration to all of us. So we are eagerly waiting to hear from you, Madam. Over to you to address the audience. Thank you. Thank you, Komal, for first thing for inviting me. It is always a pleasure to me come to any program, your yours and Niranjan, and I know you have been working so hard. You have been to Lucknow lately for our conference and uh, meetings here. Uh, it is uh, really wonderful that you've been organizing this program under this edges for so many times, and this is the last program before your great election goes on, and we are all eagerly waiting for your success in this uh, election. I my good wishes to this uh, today's uh, workshop today what we have organized because all the three speakers are par excellence including you so you are also one of the speakers for today's uh, program but I know JB Sharma I've been hearing JB Sharma and Aparna both I know they are par excellence in their field and they will be doing justice to their talks uh, besides this I know that. You know, for all urinary symptoms, we all understand, especially in UP, women, for the first time, they would go always to a gynecologist. Their first contact is a gynecologist. So it is very important for us to be aware about of all these problems. And if we find something extraordinary, I know we have, we need somewhere where we can always refer our patients and uh, he will be doing justice to those patients. And... Uh, I really would really wish success to today's program and I'm anxious to hear to meet and see Vineet and hear his uh, guest of honor speech because for a long time I haven't met him and I haven't seen Vineet for such a long time. So Komal, wishing you again a great success. My all blessings are with you and whenever you do anything, I'm there always behind you. Thank you, Komal and Niranjan, both of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Madam, uh, for your lovely words and your blessings. And your blessings truly made my day. I'm so happy that uh, you have been here today, uh, accepted the invitation to be the chief guest. We are really, truly honored. And uh, looking forward to visit Madam Lucknow. I, it is always a pleasure to come to Lucknow. And I remember coming a number of times and I think in this last uh, time since the ICOG, again, twice I have visited for the UPCon and the Lucknow CME. So I want to come again and again. I will keep coming to Lucknow and meet you, madam. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, now I call upon our guest of honor, Dr. Vineet Mishra. Vineet Mishra, we all know he is a doyant and a legend awesome. from Ahmedabad. He is a director of IK. KKDRC and head of the Department of Institute of Kidney Dialysis and Research Center, practicing at Dr. H. L. Trivedi Institute of Transplant Sciences. He underwent fellowship training at University of Pittsburgh, USA, Seoul National University, South Korea. Published many articles in peer review and national and international journal, research in fields of STEM, apps, SUI, female sexual dysfunction, and he has also been. Uh, the uh, held of affair at Foxy's as a vice president in 2016. So many Euro-Gynac conferences organized in Ahmedabad, you know. I attended almost all. 
So really happy to be part of these programs. They are really very interactive and most sought for and a great learning experience. His students are also all over and they're also doing so well. So he's teacher par excellence and he's a guide and mentor to me too. So Dr. Vineet Mishra, sir, over to you to address the audience. Hi, good morning, ma'am. Good evening. Good afternoon. Welcome, J.B. Sharma, sir. Kindly and... unmute, sir. We need, sir. Yes. Mm. Okay. So. Yeah. Komal, thank you. Thank you for inviting me and uh, giving me this honor. But you know what is? Yes. I am able to see Anuj there, your husband. But the best part that I liked was I am I am face to face seeing uh, Madam, Madam Chandravati. And you know, we, we call her Mai. Mai means mother or, or uh, she is mother to me. And let me share a secret. It is always nice to see even Ruchika there from Agra, Nita, Nita from Ahmedabad. We have Poonam. We have, uh, if, oh, the JB Sharma, JB boss is there. We have Ami, Ami Ben, and of all, we have Aparna. It is nice to see, you know. And uh, Komal, you have done a great thing bringing so stalwarts, especially Chandravati, madam. It is, you know, always uh, nice to see her and take her Ashirwan. And let me share you one, one secret which none of you know. Nita, Madam Chandravati is from Amdava, is from Gujarat. Can you imagine? Yes, yes, yes. And I know generations to generations before they migrated to UP and now, yes, she is that stalwart and stalwart of her capacity. Probably very few exist in this country. It is always nice to see her, the energy that she has and the blessing that she gives, you know. But I am aghast with the technology which is there. Can you see? Komal is traveling and Madam Sabarwal is traveling. And then also we are in a, in a conference and in an academic feast. So now probably all conferences, all Foxy conferences, everything should, should be on Zoom and WebEx. Am I right, madam? Anna, <laughs> madam, I'm hona chahiye. Kya leke sab jaga pe bhago, ye karo, iski jaga pe, there can be conferencing, knowledge sharing, right on WebEx and Zoom. But the initiative, Komal, that you have done is excellent. I have all my blessings to you. I have always called your husband as Anuj, as my younger brother. And uh, only you can control, only you can control Anuj. I tell him on his face, Madam Chandravati, oh, ladka bhot acha hai. Pan kya hai? Ah, usko kya kehte hai? Komal control kar rahi hai, toh bhot achi baat. That is on, little bit on personal basis. But Komal, all the best. And you, whatever venture you do in Foxy or any organization, we are all with you. All our blessings are with you. So everything sh good should happen. And let us enjoy the academic feast, the stalwarts that you have brought on the platform, which is big thing. Thank you, Komal, for giving us that opportunity. At least you made my day when I saw, when I got Darshan of Chandravati Nath. And all my, all my, this thing, you know, ah, Ruchika runs journals and everything, doing big thing in Agra. I have Nita, Nita is there. All, though she is from Gujarat, Ahmedabad, but I have not met her since quite a time, but it is always nice seeing her on Zoom. JB boss, the big no, man, <laughs> big man, big man. No, no, and, sir. No. And still, and still bigger is Aparna. Aparna oh, yeah. is, Aparna is, मतलब वो कहते हैं ना मैडम कि कोई लोग मतलब वो वो गली में क्रिकेट खेलते हैं ना 
हम उसको फलिया कहते हैं फलिया में क्रिकेट खेलते हैं कुछ लोग क्या कहते हैं डिस्ट्रिक्ट में क्रिकेट खेलते हैं पन जो सही जो बड़ा क्रिकेट खेलते हैं ना मैडम वो सिर्फ क्या कहते हैं जेबी शर्मा साहब हैं जो इंटरनेशनल होते हैं और क्या कहते हैं अपर्णा है थैंक यू कोमल ऑल द बेस्ट थैंक यू थैंक यू सो मच सर फॉर द लवली वर्ड्स एंड एंड सम लाइट मोमेंट इन योर टॉक दे वर रियली रियली हार्टनिंग एंड थैंक यू थैंक यू फॉर बीइंग हियर एंड ब्लेसिंग अस योर सपोर्ट मींस अ लॉट टू मी एंड आई लुक फॉरवर्ड टू इट एंड थैंक यू चंद्रावति मैडम एंड डॉक्टर विनीत मिश्रा सर फ्रॉम बॉटम ऑफ माय हार्ट कोमल आई आई हैव अ मीटिंग आई हैव अ मीटिंग some of my time goes yes, to gandhinagar so i have a meeting i will probably okay. join you in between thank you yes, everybody yes sir sure sir ha ah, pranam madam thank you pranam thank you sabko namaste pranam aashirwad de do madam zoom pe hi de do hai na zoom pe hi de do pakka zoom dono haath se pakka aashirwad pakka pura dil se sabko aaj madam ka aashirwad mil gaya hai namaskar madam thank you madam thank you Thank yes. you, thank you, everyone. thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you uh, uh, for all your blessings, and it uh-huh. means a lot. Uh, with that note, I will hand over back to Ruchika to take forward the scientific proceedings. We are waiting eagerly for Dr. J. B. Sharma's talk. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Prachi, please post the. Yeah. please post the cvs so we i would like to welcome dr jb sharma sir uh, for that for the chairpersons of the session sir we have senior consultant dr ami mehta madam she is from rajkot rajkot and she is the past president of rajkot menopause society and she is also the past president of rajkot ops gynae society welcome ami ma'am so now we have our uh, esteemed dr neeta thakre ma'am she is the past chairperson of foxi urogyne committee and she is uh, she has so many awards and everything to her credit she is also the ex assistant professor of ikdrc kesar sayal medical college ahmedabad and she is senior consultant at kd hospital ahmedabad and she has been writing blogs for the times of india welcome you ma'am we now have dr professor poonam yadav with us she is professor in sn medical college agra and she has so many awards to her credit including the foxi corion award for her research and she has written a book of medical disorders in pregnancy which was awarded foxi dc datta award and she is currently the secretary of agra ops gynae society so welcome dr poonam yadav so i now invite ami madam to kindly introduce jb sharma sir and welcome him for his talk a good evening everyone uh, to discuss overactive bladder we have with dr jb sharma sir from aims delhi it is said that doctors save the lives and teacher make the lives and sir is both uh, uh, sir has done uh, his urogynec from kings college london and started fellowship on it also at a, and he has published uh more than uh, in more than 30, 350 books he has published the chapters we are eagerly waiting to uh, listen the sir so over to you dr jb sharma sir okay yeah thank you very much at the outset i uh, thank uh, madam komal chavan madam for uh, inviting me here and uh, respected chairperson dr ruchika and it's great to have blessing of chandravati madam and dr vinit misra and my uh, Uh, colleague dr neeta thakre and uh, so thank you very much so we now go to the overactive bladder syndrome i mean can you see my slides ma'am mm-hmm. oh sorry we yeah, are just oh, we are just trying to see yeah. yeah. okay okay you can see the slides ma'am yes sir okay okay 
yeah so again the uh, thanks uh, thanks a lot and dr komal madam so we will be discussing about overactive bladder syndrome and we know that how common it is i mean and it really the patient who are suffering from it they are really troubled by it and uh, so are the gynecologists who attend to these patients so we know that international continent society has uh, done uh, like definition of it as well as international continent society and or the overactive bladder syndrome as urgency with or without urge urinary incontinence or usually it is with frequency and nocturia there is no proven or identifiable infections metabolic disorder or other obvious urethrocycle pathologies in this case so in other words these patients have got basically urgency frequency nocturia in absence of urinary tract infection so that's what i tell my post graduate that symptoms of uti in absence of uti is called overactive bladder syndrome that means the patient has to go see has to go see cannot control unlike uh, uh, stress incontinence in which raised inter abdominal pressure causes leaking and they say in this case there is no such leaking the patient has to go she has to go so let me see maybe getting up seven eight times in the night ten times in the day time like that almost two third of the patients with this uh, do not have incontinence and overactive bladder can be further classified as oeb wet with incontinence and oeb dry without incontinence how to differentiate wet means she leaks also and in dry also that she has the sensation as if she wants to go to the washroom but she not incontinence she doesn't leak urine so we call it oeb dry but she is troubled by the symptoms so it's not that that's not a problem that's also equal problem and uh, so we have to treat both of them and the prevalence of overactive bladder syndrome in patients of more than 40 years usually one in six persons will have it almost like you can say 12% or so and most commonly reported symptom is frequency by 85% and other symptoms are urgency 54% urge incontinence 36% and almost 60% of respondent with symptoms consult a doctor but only 27% receive treatment so it's like just like hypertension patient you know many only 60% go uh, to the doctor and then only 27% receive treatment so many patients are suffering in silence that is what we don't want actually we know that in uh, control of menstruation basically include the sympathetic and parasympathetic system under the control of higher centers including the brain stem pons and cerebral cortex so sympathetics are inhibitory parasympathetic s22 s4 they are stimulatory and then we have got muscarinic receptor gem 1 to m5 especially m3 this is important because when we are uh, like using the drug they usually should be working on m3 receptors so this is the you know same thing pontine maturation center is there and from there we get sympathetic t10 to l2 and parasympathetic s2 to s4 and we have got pudendal nerve also s2 to s4 which has got a voluntary control basically so when the patient basically uh, like uh, is not passing you know at that time sympathetic is dominant and that will sympathetic will basically uh, relax the bladder and constrict the urethra while parasympathetic comes into action when patient has to pass urine so that will cause contraction of the bladder that means detrusion and relaxation of the urethra in, in addition to that pudendal nerve can cause voluntary stoppage of passage of urine so same thing basically again we have discussed same thing we have discussed already so how what is the diagnosis most important is the basically clinical diagnosis based on history and symptoms that's what i tell my post graduates that whenever you are seeing a urogyny patient please do spend some time on the patient take her history in detail you need to spend more time with her then then only we need to investigate to rule out any other infection uh, organic structural etiologies and urodynamics are not necessary as the diagnosis usually of overactive bladder syndrome uh, i mean can be seen without that also but rarely in complicated case mixed incontinence or failed surgery then we can do urodynamics also in urodynamic study we will see basically that to zero overactivity during filling phase so this is the history taking that detail history of urological symptom of scanny symptom any neurological condition of the patient any medical condition like diabetes uh, hypertension uh, uh, surgical conditions any patient had past history of surgery social psychological factors radiation pelvic trauma all these are important like those patient of ca service who had radiation therapy their bladder becomes very constricted so they tend to have urge incontinence or small uh, bladder similarly patient with thimble bladder uh, like you know past history of tuberculosis their bladder is also very small then they you know i talked about diabetes and patient on uh, anti hypertensive therapy especially like diuretic so these patients tend to pass more urine then detail history taking of uh, how much water she is taking some patients are taking too much tea too much coffee too much water intake so that also can make the patient to pass urine so all this history taking is important any past history of trauma and like you know one of my patient had uh, past history of uh, uh, meningomyelocele treated in her childhood you know similarly other patient had multiple sclerosis so these are important condition where you need to uh, you know avoid and then the in incontinence history any characterization of incontinence 
exactly how many times he passes urine in a day and it's a good idea to use any of the questionnaire there are international questionnaire available free of cost on the uh, uh, from the internet we can download any of them like king's health questionnaire is there in continent questionnaire iciq is there so any of the questionnaire we can use then length and severity of symptoms how long patient has been having in one year two years and severity how much it is affecting the quality of life so that is important impact impact on quality of life and associated bowel problem in quality of life it's also important many patients like you know they can't even go out in the market they can't go to the temple they can't you know do uh, go to parties so that is a severe impact on quality of life or sometimes they have to use like diapers etc so that you have to take in detail history and associated bowel symptoms also on examination again systemic uh, systematic vaginal and pelvic examination apart from that before i will talk to do general physical examination including neurological examination mental status of the patient mobility lumbar sacral sensory motor bc reflex anal wink knee ankle artery. so what i meant to say neurological examination is very very important for these patients which we normally don't do in a gynae patient while we are examining the patient then of course general uh, any anemia pallor any thyroid any jvp raised heart chest examination because some patient may have you know chronic obstructive airway disease so they may have rails and ronchi etc because that is important for post operative condition also pre operative condition also and that has to be treated along with the urge incontinence or urinary incontinence then on local examination condition of the mucosa there can be urogenital atrophy in absence of uh, estrogen in elderly patient and topical estrogen therapy may be used for such patient urethral ability to rule out cautive test and all and demonstrates of incontinence basically there any associated prolapse anti wall posti wall apical prolapse by manual exam is also important so all these sometimes they can be have seen two three cases in which there was a big fibroid pressing on the bladder patient had you know incontinence because of that another patient had retroperitoneal you know uh, retroperitoneal tumor which was pressing on the everything was being pushed down so some patient may have those symptom and that can cervical fibroid in other condition so these are very important condition then we do ancillary tests like voiding intake diary that's very important usually one week diary is used but the, there is a, a, a 48 to 72 hours diary also or the weekend diary so in that case i mean we give the diary patient notes from the beginning only like she gets up at say 5 o'clock in the morning so from till that uh, till she sleeps so she uh, she writes how much a uh, uh, fluid she took i mean including all tea coffee any uh, drinks or water etc so total amount on the left hand side and right hand side whenever she passes urine so we calculate it and uh, this is important i have seen at least three to four five patient which patient was drinking almost 4.5 to 5 liters of water so there is this concept going on that if we drink too much of water it is good for our facial glow etc so please i mean too much of water is not good because that can cause patient incontinence so we need 1.8 to 2 liters for our renal function proper so that we shouldn't take more than that then overactive bladder incontinence diary the same thing i talked about urine analysis basically we need to do urine culture and cytology as just to rule out urinary tract infection post void residual sometimes uh, is there that you can calculate with the ultrasound and usually it should be less than 50 ml or sometimes some people say more less than 80 ml also and pad test can be used in this case i mean we give a pad to the patient we weigh the pad like suppose it was 10 gram before and then we uh, patient weighs it and then after say 10 to 15 minutes he walks with that and then we uh, again test it so that uh, if this the weight is more than 1 gram before that means she has leaked during this time so then the role of cystometry we have done that uh, defining underlying pathophysiology bladder feeling involuntary detrusive contraction low bladder compliance urethral obstruction impaired detrusive contractility and directing treatment so this can be ruled out but routine cystometry or uh, urodynamics is not required really but only complicated cases we need to do but if you if you do then and that bladder feeling phase i mean normally in the feeling phase that detrusive should remain relaxed but in this case there will be detrusive overactive or contraction that is the diagnosis of basically overactive bladder syndrome that means this bladder which should remain relaxed contracts during the feeling phase that's how we make the diagnosis now why to treat any physical social sexual psychological and occupational impact is there of the condition and is often associated with comorbidity such as sleep disturbance and all if someone is getting up five six times in the night you can imagine how you know she will not be fresh in the morning and she will be tired whole day then depression and poor quality of life will be there so almost 32% patient had these symptoms they felt depressed and all and they can't sleep well and the another important because many of these patients are elderly so they are also at an increased risk of falls and fractures from rushing to the toilet you know sometimes the patient rushes and so it's very important that in the washroom of these patient we should have some rail to hold and the, the rugs should be there and the water should not be there on the floor otherwise these patient can fall so that is also important now management is usually non surgical 
and uh, surgical treatment is very rarely done for uh, uh, our rectal bladder syndrome just to complete the list we are using it so mainly these are lifestyle changes bladder training drugs and very rarely we need to go for surgical treatment which i'll be discussing so first line therapy is always behavioral therapy and in this case behavioral therapy will be discussing like lifestyle changes reducing weight and uh, exercise etc we will discuss second line are anti muscarinic drugs or beta 3 agonist and then third line intra that to the uh, botulinum toxin injection ptns sns or rarely surgical treatment as a last resort so usually we do the lifestyle change that means weight reduction if the patient is obese basically they do know there is abdominal wall weight also that all presses on the bladder so weight reduction of 4 5 kg or 6 months is very useful for this patient otherwise so that will be good for her for her knees for her hips etc and she will be feel more confident then she should avoid caffeine and smoking this is important we need to ask the patient what is making her to pass urine or what is making her urgency like i had a friend he after drinking one cup of coffee coffee he had he was a male basically he had so much urgent content that he had to go to the washroom seven eight times some patient have with coke some patient have with berries so like that everyone has to find out their uh, this thing but definitely caffeine tea smoking coke etc they are think so we should avoid those food but we can drink water but not in excess and we can drink like coconut water or some juice they they can be good then physical therapy or arnold kegel's exercise are very important but in this case you need to train the patient preferably by physiotherapy i mean it's a good idea to have a regular and uh, you know dedicated physiotherapist in your clinic if you are doing urogyny so they can spend like say half an hour to 45 minutes with the patient they can teach them all these things otherwise as a gynecologist also we can also teach them patient can try to pass urine and hold on to it she can try to pass motion hold on to it she can put a pillow between two thighs and contact it so she need to do it 15 minutes in the morning 15 minutes in the evening so exercise are good for health they cost nothing that's what i tell my patient and but minimum give it at least 12 week 3 months before saying that they did not work and they will definitely have some benefit of this patient we can use biofeedback and electrical stimulation for additional benefit but not mandatory and then bladder training will be discussing so this is the other, and of course uh, same thing uh, you know avoid drinking too much of tea water and you know only moderate volume of fluid 1.8 to 2 liter empty your bladder before going to sleep always empty your bladder completely empty your bladder before and after intercourse reduce your caffeine intake drink bladder friendly fluids and avoid going to the bathroom just in case many times you just have nothing else to do to go to the washroom don't do that let the bladder has its capacity and this is bladder training or retraining in this case basically patient passes urine at regular time by clock simply i mean this i got lot of material on this but just in the beginning like suppose patient is getting up at 6 o'clock to 6 o'clock and we can try to hold up like 8 o'clock so first first week 2 hour next week to our 50 minutes next week to and a half hour then quarter to 3 and 3 hours like that so every week she increases the time and along with she is doing other other things also like she is doing pelvic exercises she is drinking less tea coffee and you know and we are giving some medication also to the patient like that so kegel exercise we have already done so minimum th- i mean there is a uh, it's a first line conservative management and there is a scientific evidence that they, they help cochrane database also says so minimum 3 months 12 weeks is required before saying they have not worked and then biofeedback is in addition to kegel exercise so that patient is contacting right muscle but the machine cost about 8 to 10 lakh rupees i mean but not that you have to have it but it will with this patient will contact the right muscle that's the advantage of biofeedback same electrical stimulation also that it strengthen the muscle in the lower pelvis electrodes are temporarily placed in the vagina or rectum to stimulate nearby muscle so this is useful so same thing basically all these the biofeedback electric stimulation they are augmenting basically kegel exercise only then most patient will require a medical therapy and usually we have traditionally given anticholinergic drugs the therapy with the, they have inhibitory effect on sphincter and we tricyclic antidepressant like imipramine were popular in the past but not anymore but still imipramine may be a good drug for patients of nocturnal and nocturnal aneurysm as the adolescent girl so 25 mg can be done given to these patient alpha agonists are not that much but estrogen again by reversal of erogenital atrophy but systematic estrogen not needed but definitely the patient had got erogenital atrophy so topical estrogen therapy in the form of pavlon or any estriol cream uh, i mean first week weekly later on thrice weekly for three months can be tried then others like botulinum toxin intracycle injection of this can also be tried as a last resort and so principle will be they decrease that to the activity increase bladder capacity and commonly used drugs basically will inhibit it and this is the main step of therapy basically they inhibit bladder contraction through acetylcholine receptors and but they have a side effect in the form of dry mouth constipation some drowsiness and somnolence blurred vision dry mouth especially elderly patient and if you given for long term therapy like you are giving her for 3 4 5 years then sometimes they can cause some 
uh, uh, this no some basically neurological symptoms so avoid using them in elderly age group for more than 2 years or give under basically observation so these are the i mean you can just remember one or two drugs like i am fond of using either daripenacin or solifenacin so uh, uh, daripenacin is 7.5 mg usually once a day uh, uh, but you can go up to double dose of that. Osolipanacin is equivalent 5 milligram. You can go up to 10 milligram once a day and give it for three months initially. Okay, that is important, but avoid these drugs in case of uh, uh, close angle glaucoma. Then beta 3 adrenergic agonist drugs are Mismira background. So that is 25 milligram initially, but you can go up to 50 milligram once only. And that is, uh, works on the beta 3 adrenergic uh, uh, receptors basically. So those patients of cardiac disease, it's better to avoid Mira background because that acts through the adrenergic receptors. But patients with narrow angle glaucoma or who have dry uh, mouth, etc., then they, they are very useful for Mira background. So in other words, for heart patient, use anticholinergic drug and for uh, sin, uh, side effects of anticholinergic drugs like or narrow angle glaucoma, then use Mira background. And sometimes we can, if the patient has got no side effects and all, we can combine the two also. Like we started dairy financing for three months. Along with, of course, these drugs are not alone. Drugs are augmenting uh, pellet exercises. They are augmenting, uh, yeah, they are, uh, apart from that, they, uh, you know, they are, we are uh, less tea, coffee, less water intake also in there. So that is what we do. And really, botulinum toxin, as a last resort, we can use basically 200 to 300 units. I attended like King's College uh, uh, training. So in this case, what you do, basically, there is 1 ml of the botulinum toxin. You dilute it to 10 ml. And then we do cystoscopy. And along with cystoscopy, we give this injection at 10 places. So that means 1 ml. 1 ml, we have been counted to 10 ml. So uh, 1 ml at 1 point. So 10 points, we give botulinum toxin. So that also is work, but only as a last resort. So we have, we, uh, though most of these drugs, uh, solifenacin, they work on M3 selective anticholinergic drugs. Imipramine, I told you only for uh, not a very good drug these days, but sometimes we can use it for uh, like, you know, nocturnal aneurysis in girls, you know. So combination therapy can be used and uh, that, that okay refractory cases you need to do any post void raised urine always look out like in north india with this stone is a big problem sometimes there may be papilloma in the bladder so those patients who are not responding to treatment then you can do urodynamic study in them cystoscopy can be done and sometimes upper renal upper tract study like renal ultrasound ct mri i had a patient who had basically uh, like you know stones in the urine so that is also important so Mira background told you 25 to 50 milligram, it's a beta-3 receptor agonist can be used for these patients. Surgical treatment as a last resort only, cysto like cystoscopy injection of botulinum toxin. Augmentin is enterocystoplasty, that means this is operation in which bladder capacity is very much reduced, like after thimble bladder, after radiation cystitis. So there's some these surgeons or, uh, you know, these people, they can use the piece of sigmoid colon or a piece of small intestine with this uh, entry. They can augment the size of the uh, bladder, but this is last resort, I have never done it, but just to complete the list. So to conclude, improved understanding of pathophysiology is important and contrib contribution of alternate neural receptors, better understanding of certain is needed and mechanical vaccine anti muscarinic drug and side effects is important and refer to urologist and surgical distinct. So thank you very much. So just in the in nutshell, basically, a patient who has got urge to go to pass urine and in absence of UTI is, uh, is urge incontinence or active bladder syndrome. And usually history taking examination is important. And then usually we give ask them to do pelliflo exercises, bladder training, less tea copy, and one of the drugs like Mira background or basically anticholinergic drug like Daripenacin, solipenacin, and then we assess these patients after three months. The treatment can be given up to two years, and then we give drug holiday to these patients. So most patients, 70-80 percent patients, can be treated like. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for a very elaborative talk. So uh, the uh, hall is open for discussion. I would like our esteemed uh, chairpersons, Dr. Neeta Thakre, ma'am, and Dr. Poonam Yadav. Uh, to ask, yeah, and uh, so, the concluding remarks. Uh, so, uh, Dr. J.B. Sharma, uh, that was really wonderful talk. You covered every aspect of the topic, and you. it was, uh, you know, conveyed in a very simplified manner, especially the importance of history taking. And also, uh, what are the causative factors that you showed? And uh, the best thing which I liked about it is that uh, you uh, told that uh, there are uh, social, physical, sexual, psychological, and occupational 
factors that are affected impacted by uh, in these patients and that is the that is why we need to actually identify them and treat them give them the help uh, they uh, usually take it as a condition which happens with age and they neglect them themselves and i think uh, with a better understanding of the subject and how to treat it for any uh, gynecologist it's easier to help them uh, thank you so much sir thank you thank you thank you uh, good to see you after a long ah, yes. <laughs> thank you certainly certainly you been really hope you are busy. fine man dr punam okay thank you sir sir you have your talk was well elaborated and it's a just a presentation like a great teacher uh beside the medical treatment you have also uh, take great emphasis on the counseling and psychosocial aspect of the psychosocial health of a patient especially in cases of overactive bladder syndrome or rest of the other bladder related issues all pharmacological and non pharmacological treatment were well described thank you sir for your sir i have a talk. question yes, uh, you said about drug holiday so how much drug holiday practically we can give for how long they can continue solifenacin and all yeah madam after 2 years i give the drug holiday for 3 to 6 months and during this time we hope that patient has lost 4 5 kg of weight she has decreased tea coffee water intake she has lost weight and she has like you know her pelvic floor muscles have become better so we hope those factors have taken over and then we can give it so we give it 3 to 6 but in my practical experience that almost 50 to 60% patient are okay after that so i assess them after 3 to 6 months again but some patient i ask them you have seen life of with both with the drugs without drugs which was better so 50% patient say no sir we want to go back on the drugs so you can do but avoid after 65 70 years of age like you know don't too much long uh, therapy there have been some neuro cognitive dysfunction has been observed in this patient on long term therapy so just observe so what, them what but is your experience can... with yeah maybe with mirabigron compared uh -huh. to solifenacin हाँ नहीं बिना पेपर इज हाईली इफेक्टिव बट जस्ट अवॉइड इन कार्डिक पेशेंट्स I mean, just be cautious. It's not that so absolutely contraindicated, but mirabagron is a very good drug. And I have about ten to in my practice, man, sixty percent percent of mine are on uh, anticholinergic drugs, daripenacin or solifenacin. About thirty-five to forty percent percent are on mirabagron. Ten percent percent are on both. The combination of <laughs> one option is you can increase the dose. Like mirabagron can be increased to fifty milligram, but then the side effects tend to be more. Similarly, solifenacin from five you can go to ten milligram. But other option is that you know five milligram solifenacin with twenty five milligram background may be a better choice because then the side effects will not be added up. And sir, in, no case, in yes. case of mix and incontinence, uh, yes, which yes. we will treat first? Yeah, in in case of mix incontinence, you have to ask the patient what is bothering her more. I mean, there will be one dominant symptom, one you know, like I mean, if if the urgent incontinence is dominant, then we need to treat the urgent incontinence first with daripenacin or or mirabagron. Along with in those mixed incontinence patient, I tend to give them other things like you know, pelvic floor exercise, decreased tea coffee intake, you know, blood uh, blood training. Plus, I also give duloxetine, twenty milligram OD. So twenty milligram OD for three months uh, uh, with the uh, daripenacin or solifenacin, and then I assess the patient after three months. But if the patient has got mixed incontinence, but like and uh, we, in spite of this treatment, but her main uh, predominant symptom is stress incontinence, then I have done surgical treatment also, like you no know, TOT, but don't do in the beginning only. Like after three to six months, I ask that patient. So by this time, like uh, her mira background or solifenacin has taken care of her urge incontinence, and but she say that I am troubled because uh, uh, this duloxetine is not very effective. I mean, treatment for stress incontinence usually surgical. Medical treatment is not that effective, but treatment of OAB is essentially medical treatment. So whatever is bothering her more, we need to treat that first. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir, for your pearls of wisdom and sharing your experience with us. It was we a lovely, love... fabulous talk, Dr. J. B. Sharma. Oh, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. Really, uh, a word what you said and uh, really insightful about the drug therapy. When to give drug holiday, I think that was so lovely and well discussed. Thank you so much for joining, J.P. Sharma. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Doctor Aparna also is meeting. Yeah. So Thank we you. we are next moving on to the stress urinary talk incontinence talk by Doctor Aparna Hegde, madam. So for that, I would like to invite our chairpersons. We have Doctor Minakshi Ahuja, who is a senior uh, gyne gynecologist at Fortis Hospital. Uh, I think I couldn't see her. We we have Aruna Biradar with us. She is. Uh, from Shri B M 
Patil Medical College. She is a professor at Vijayapura, Karnataka, and she has been awarded the Young Scientist Award at her university. So welcome, Dr. Aruna. And we have our uh, esteemed Dr. Monica Gupta. She was also an active member of Foxy Medical Disorders Committee, and uh, she is the chairperson of AOGD Urogyne Committee. Welcome, Dr. Monica. Uh, so our esteemed chairpersons who would like to introduce Dr. Aparna Higde, madam. Uh, I think there is some poor connectivity. So I would like to introduce Dr. Esteemed Dr. Aparna Hegde, madam. She is an associate professor, Urogyne Kama Hospital at Grant Medical College, Mumbai. And she is a consultant urogynecologist at Surya Hospital, Mumbai. Uh, she is a founder and director of a center at Delhi, Urogyne Center. And she is running centers at both Delhi as well as Mumbai. And she is chairperson and foundation of International Urogyne Assistant. She is editorial board member of International Urogyne Journal. And she is also member of International Urogyne Committee of Prolapse. And she is a senior visiting fellow at IIM Ahmedabad also. She has so many awards to her credit. So it is like Neeti Ayog Award, MIT Elevate Award, Skoll Award, British Medical Journal, South Asia Award for Maternal and Child Health Team. And Social Entrepreneur of the Year Award, Women Change Maker Award. Fellow, he, she has been awarded Fellowship of Menopause Society of Sri Lanka. So over to Dr. Aparna, Madam. Welcome you, ma'am. Oh, well, thank you so much for having me, Komal. And it's so great to uh, be in the presence of such uh, stalwarts. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, and uh, I go back many years with Niranjan and Komal. So it's good to be here. Yeah, so I'm going to talk about SUI, right? Um, one second, can you see my slides? Yes. Yeah. 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 So Dr. J.P. Sharma has covered evaluation of patient of incontinence, right? So I'm not going to go there because I have paucity of time. I'm going to go on to the management of SUI. So you've come to, a, you've evaluated a patient well, and now you've gathered that the patient has SUI, right? Yeah. Uh, even in mixed incontinence, all I'm going to talk about will apply for a patient for the SUI component, right? So first, of course, is uh, lifestyle and behavioral modification. So obviously, weight loss, smoking has to be stopped. You need to treat chronic cough and constipation, right? Now, Dr. J.B. Sharma has spoken a lot about Kegel exercises and how it is very important to uh, ensure the pelvic muscle strength, uh, strength increases for both kinds of incontinence. I'm going to park it for now. I'm going to cover this in greater detail as we go forward. Right, uh, And then fluid intake is also very important in SUI because a lot of women will drink a lot of water. So you should restrict the amount of fluids to five to eight glasses of liquids a day. Less than five glasses uh, would concentrate the urine and irritate the bladder, but more than eight is not required. One glass being 230 ml. Right? Uh, and time voiding is extremely important. So uh, as Dr. J.B. Shama spoke about the bladder diary, uh, I uh, do a very thorough bladder diary. All my patients will fill a three-day bladder diary. And you will find a lot of patients, especially doctors, you'll see, because we are so used to postponing voiding, right? So, uh, you know, we'll avoid out of five hours, six hours, and we're used to going at large volumes. We get our bladder used to holding large volumes. So when you see that a patient is holding very large volumes and leaking at large volumes, it's so important to impose time voiding, right? Make them go every three hours, even if they don't feel like going. And over time, bladder gets used to the idea of going early. And uh, at the same time, when they have mixed incontinence, then after you do pelvic muscle training, you then help the patient to uh, increase progressively the interval at which they avoid, right? So time voiding is very important, even in SUI. Now, when it comes to medication, you have two, uh, two medications, right? So all of us know about estrogen cream. So every patient in incontinence, especially in, who's menop uh, in a woman who's menopausal, you have to give local uh, estrogen cream uh, for literally six months, right? Daily for three weeks, and then twice a week for six months. And then duloxetine. So duloxetine is banned in many countries, especially in the United States because of side effects. Uh, but duloxetine I use only for very short periods. It's like when a patient comes to you and then they want to postpone surgery or any therapy for a couple of months or, you know, uh, uh, because their exam student, the child is exam going or uh, after immediately after surgery, before the sling takes effect, uh, you know, you want to give uh, uh, duloxetine for a little while, right? So the way it acts is that it increases the amount of glutamate in the pudendal nerve 
ganglion. And that is excitatory for the parental nerve and it increases the level of uh, signaling of the external sphincter of the urethra. And that's how it helps in SUI. So duloxetine cannot be given long-term because the side effects are quite severe, right? So now how, how do we treat it, right? Now, before I go on to the main treatment, I'm just going to cover things available in the, uh, internationally. So you also get pessaries with knobs. I've used those, but not so use, uh, easy to uh, use for patients. Again, it's top gap. So the uh, uh, regular pessaries, the ring pessary, incontinence pessary, uh, dish pessaries, they have a knob. Can you see the knob here? And that knob will go beneath the urethra. Uh, you know, and so it helps to occlude the leaking. Next thing, uh, now this is the main part of the talk. Um, I do very strong pelvic floor muscle training in my clinic. In fact, uh, literally 50% of my patients don't require surgery because they respond only to pelvic muscle therapy. Now, how does it help in, uh, in SUI? So our, uh, we have two types of fibers in our pelvic floor. Type 1 are the long contraction fibers and type 2 are the short contraction fibers. So you will exercise and, and improve the strength of both of them. Right? So when you improve the strength of type 1 fibers or the long contraction fibers, it is regular strength training. And so you improve the stiffness and structural support of the pelvic floor over time. But when you improve the strength of type 2 fibers, what type 2 fibers are the quick contraction fibers, right? When you say a two second hold, two second relax, that's a type 2 fibers. So what happens is over time, you will strengthen it over three to four months. And then you'll teach the patient something called as bracing or performing the knack. What does it mean? It means that before any woman uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, does any physical activity, that leads to increase in abdominal pressure, like coughing, laughing, sneezing, etc. They have to consciously contract. So two second hold and then cough. So you consciously do it. And when you keep on doing it consciously, over time, it becomes a behavioral modification. So body automatically learns to contract before coughing, laughing, sneezing, etc. And it really works beautifully. It's called bracing or performing the knack. Now, both of these helps only after the muscles are strengthened. Now, how do you strengthen the muscles, right? So you do get... So something called vaginal cones. Now, what are vaginal cones? These are weighted cones, but which you hold in the vagina and is used for strength training of the pelvic floor muscles. So the woman has to kind of hold that cone in the vagina for around 20 minutes a day, starting with lower weight and expanding progressively, the amount increasing progressively the, the weight held. And the cones weigh from 20 to 150 grams. I don't really like it because uh, patients are not really compliant, but it's available, right? Now, then it comes to then you come to Kegel exercises, right? Now Kegel exercises, all of us know what they are. They are a voluntary inward and upward contraction of squeeze the pelvic floor. Now the issue is that in the in literature, uh, you know they you know the number of contractions recommended have ranged from eight to twelve three times a day to almost two hundred contractions per day. Duration from four seconds to thirty to forty seconds, and duration of treatment from one week to six months, commonly three months. So generally, I would like a patient to be able to hold a contraction ten second long. Uh, and relax for 10 seconds, 10 times, right? Uh, that's what this, uh, the strength of type 1 fibers I'm aiming for, right? Um, but the problem with Kegel exercises is that 50% of patients cannot identify their muscles. And in fact, 27% of patients will do reverse Kegel. They will push when you're asking them to contract, right? Uh, and many times patients are just told verbally how to do Kegel. You actually have to examine and do modified Oxford score. One thing I need to add to what Dr. Yavi Sharma said about evaluation is in every patient, I evaluate pelvic floor muscle strength. Put two fingers in the vagina, ask them to squeeze and evaluate the strength. There's a modified Oxford score. Based upon that, I can really understand whether a woman can even identify her muscles. When, when a woman can't identify the muscles, just telling them to do Kegel exercise won't work, right? So you need to use biofeedback. And what is biofeedback? Biofeedback is a simple tool where you put a probe in the vagina and when the woman squeezes it, she can get a visual and auditory cue about how well she's squeezing or is she really squeezing well or not. So you can actually show on the computer what to squeeze and, and you know, take them over time uh, on the course of improvement, right? So uh, in my clinic, uh, see, the thing is this, even if a woman can squeeze well, she may not have endurance. So it's not enough to just look at whether she can squeeze well. Uh, also, you have to look at the endurance. So I evaluate that clearly. And if a woman does not have endurance, even if she can squeeze, well, even they will go through biofeedback therapy, right? So uh, what uh, what we do is that they will come for 15 sittings, 10 to 15 sittings. Uh, every sitting, we will have biofeedback therapy and then electrical stimulation. So let me go through both of them, right? So what is biofeedback? There are multiple biofeedback techniques 
available. I'm just showing you one of the techniques I use in Mumbai, and there's another one in Delhi. So the, this is a maple biofeedback technique. So basically, uh, don't go by the name, just understand the concept. So basically, the biofeedback probe will have an uh, electrode, right? So you can see the yellow buttons. Those are electrodes. You could have pressure electrode, or you could have electrical electrode, right? So basically, a pressure biofeedback, sorry, or a, a electrical biofeedback. So either squeeze or actually an EMG is picked up when the muscle is contracted. So that is put in the vagina. And in this particular biofeedback system, I can actually get the uh, um, uh, muscle strength of all the individual muscles throughout the pelvic floor, 360 degrees. Can you see that? This is how I get it. Put the probe in the vagina or the anal canal and see the entire muscle grade strength. And I can actually compare it to standard, like uh, uh, other women who are normal in the same age group. Right, so when you compare, and there's a color coding we use, right? So if it is, uh, it's comparable, it's white. If it's hyper contracted, it's red. Or if it's very weak, it's blue. The patient gets a visual cue also, like how is her muscle, right? Because it's a misnomer to think that every SUI patient has weak muscles. Sometimes one side is contracted, the other side is relaxed. Even that imbalance can cause leaking of urine, right? So what do we do when they come to us? They, I will look at the rest EMG. Uh, then I will take them through a series of maximal voluntary contraction. You can see the middle rung. Uh, it's two second hold, two second relax. These are like maximal contractions, right? Two fibers. Uh, I will do that 10 times. Uh, and then I will do the endurance contraction of the type one fibers, right? So basically you look at this patient. I've been asking them to hold for 10 seconds, relax for 10 seconds. Relaxation between the contraction episodes are very, very important. Equal amount of relaxation. And you should also I'll see how well they're relaxing because they're not relaxing well. That also is very bad. So what happens is when they come for every sitting, you will see, firstly, you will teach them with the probe how to contract the right muscle. And then she will see on the computer because she's seeing this. She'll see on the computer how well she's contracting, how long she's holding. Then you give her homework based upon that. So for example, if a woman can only hold in your clinic, two second hold, two second relax, two times. Then the homework will be go to the bathroom in the morning, uh, come back, sit, do four second hold, four second relax, four times. Two seconds more than she could hold, two times more than she could hold, right? In front of you, right? So two seconds more, two times more. So four seconds hold, four seconds relax, four times. Then you're going to give a half an hour break and also then exercise the type two, uh, two fibers. Two seconds hold, two seconds relax, four times, three times a day. <clears throat> so progressively, they'll come back to you. If they're exercising very well, then you can see that they can improve the, in your clinic, then she's holding for longer. Suppose she's holding for four seconds in front of you next time. Then you will give her six second hold, six second relax six times. So every time you add two seconds more and two times more, right? And that way you build up to 10 second hold, 10 second relax 10 times and uh, half an hour break, two second hold, two second relax 10 times. And then you get a, grid, get a grid like this, right? So when all the contractions are measured in a particular sitting, I get a grid like this where I can actually evaluate, uh, you know, uh, uh, like in maximum MVC is max, in the middle grid, you can see the maximum voluntary contraction. So it's all blue here. So it's very weak, even in maximum voluntary contraction. And if you see endurance, uh, she's able to hold the middle fibers, right? Uh, on the right and the left. So I can, through the color coding, we can understand which muscles are improving over time. So see, uh, I can look at the average EMG and the peak EMG, both of the maximum voluntary contraction and the uh, endurance muscles, right? So, and on the left side is the rest. So basically, over time, they are seeing how the woman is improving. And it really, 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 really works. I can't begin to tell you how useful it is to do biofeedback therapy, electrical stimulation in our patients, you know, of SUI, even over active bladder, right? I'll give an example, right? This patient, first week when she came to me, if you look at the, uh, you know, uh, EMG, she, I told her to contract, relax. She just couldn't identify the muscles. When we trained her and when she went back home and exercised, look at this, a week later, she could hold Right, and then over time, her amplitude of contraction will also increase. The strength will increase, right? So electric. Then when they come to you, they will take them through ten seconds hold, ten seconds relax, ten times to see the endurance and give them homework. And after that, you will also do electrical stimulation. Now, electrical stimulation is like a lazy man's kegel. It's a technique for passive contraction uh, in women who can't contract pelvic floor muscles voluntarily, right? And you can uh, give that through either either the vaginal or in electrodes. And uh, they help to, in motor excitement also is analgesic, right? So basically it's like a lazy man's kegel, a probe in the vagina and you're stimulating the muscles, right? And then I can stimulate different uh, planes. I can decide which I want to stimulate more. If a muscle already contracted, I won't stimulate that. I would choose a muscle which are weak to stimulate. So there is link, link stimulation, plate stimulation, right? And then you would use different, different frequencies. 
So in urgency incontinence, I use 12.5. If it's stress incontinence, I would use 50 or 100. If it's mixed incontinence, I would use 20 hertz. And these are on and off current, right? Strengthening current. Uh, you would do something different for women who can't pee. In those, you would do relaxation biofeedback. You'll be doing biofeedback uh, to relax. And you will do electrical stimulation, which is continuous because you want to tire off the muscles. So there are different frequencies and different systems used for different kinds of leaking of urine. Cochrane review, clearly there's a recent review that's come up, which says that first line treatment, both SU and OAB is um, uh, pelvic muscle training and both biofeedback and electrical stimulation have been found to be superior to just pelvic muscle training and have been found to be superior to vaginal cones. There's a latest by uh, Cochrane review that's come up, which is a review of reviews, 2022. And it's shown biofeedback electrical stimulation is really, really good. So really, um, you know, this is something that has to be practiced more. You know, I do it very sincerely in both. We do it sincerely in our Delhi and Mumbai clinics both. Now, then comes surgical treatment, right? Now, when we do that, when conservative management has failed, you kind of, the remaining 50% in whom just the urgency uh, uh, biofeedback therapy is not work. Or when you have intrinsic sphincter deficiency. Now, what is intrinsic sphincter deficiency, right? Um, it is a condition where the sphincter is weak of the urethra. In those patients, you can't do peripheral muscle training in, alone. It is not going to be useful. In, or in, it, it, it won't be enough. In those patients, uh, ISD patients, intrinsic sphincter deficiency, you need surgical treatment, right? Or a bulking agent injection. Um, um, and if a woman is unable to comply with uh, non-surgical therapy, right? So now let's look at surgical uh, treatment. So because of paucity of time, I'm going to go through what should be done in which case, right? So just give you an idea of where what is applicable because it's so important to choose the right surgical method, right? Because it's not like one size fits all. I know this kind of surgery, so that will be done in every patient. It doesn't work like that. So historically, how has it moved, right? Earlier there was anterior repair, but uh, in which Kelly stitch was done, but 40% failure rates, Kelly stitch is not enough. So then it went on to autologous slings, right? Uh, there was the uh, um, um, uh, rectus fascia, fascia lata. Then came the retrophobic bladder neck suspension operations, Birch, open, right? And then came needle procedures. Needle procedures have gone out of uh, vogue. Now nobody does needle procedures. Then came the systemic uh, synthetic slings, right? So instead of using autonomous, uh, people started using mesh. Then came the laparoscopic Birch corpus suspension. Then came the modification synthetic slings, which is tension-free slings, the modern... TVD, retropubic sling. And finally, according to some people, the pinnacle of it all is trans operator. Why? Because simple, it's efficacious, safe, safe. But is that the case? Let's see whether you should be doing trans operator in everybody or you should pick and choose in whom you're going to do bit surgery, right? So let's go through every. Uh, so just listen to the take home messages uh, because of paucity of time. But these are, these are extremely important take home messages. When will you do which kind of surgery? Now let's come to Bursch. Now, we all know what we do in Bursch. In Bursch, we suspend the bladder neck to the Cooper's ligament bilaterally, right? Now, remember one very important thing. Never, never, never do Bursch when a woman has intrinsic sphincter deficiency, ISD. And ISD is a urodynamic diagnosis. In urodynamics, if I find that the maximal urethral closure pressure is, you know, less than 20 centimeter water uh, or the valsarval leak point pressures are low, right? Let's not go into technicalities of it. But just understand, when the woman has low valsalva leak point pressure and maximal rotor closure pressure, which means that she's got intrinsic sphincter deficiency, the sphincter itself is weak within the urethra, never do Bursch. Why? Because what does Bursch do? It pulls the bladder neck into the abdomen and keeps it open. Right? So in an ISD patient, they will leak more. I have seen patients who are undergone Bursch or even sacrocorpoplexy. And the bladder neck has been pulled up and kept open and they're leaking like a tap. So never do that. Another problem with Bursch corpus suspension is that there's an increased chance of enterocele formation because it pulls the bladder neck anteriorly, right? So the, uh, a very recent meta-analysis clearly shown that's inferior to retropubic slings, okay? You can do Bursch in, you know, when you're doing, it's a regular uh, hypermobility associated with SUI where the, uh, you know, support of the urethra is weak, the sphincter is normal. You're anyway doing hysterectomy laparoscopically in that patient, then you can combine that with the Bursch, right? But don't do, so never do it in ISD patients, one big take-home message. Then comes the retropubic bladder neck sling, which is the, uh, or the pubovaginal sling. Now, what does it mean, right? After Birch came the, uh, you know, uh, autologous fascia. And when the autologous fascia came into the picture, 
they were put to the bladder neck okay it's also called as pubo vaginal sling now ret these are good slings to put in those with isd okay now the thing about retrobiopic slings are the 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 uh, the mesh which the sorry the autologous fascia is it's non deformable right it it's not deformable because tissue right so you will put it at the bladder neck and you will put it a little tighter because isd patients you want a little bit of obstruction these are women in whom the sphincter is weak so you want a little bit of obstruction right so you will put it at the bladder neck you will do that in patients who have got isd or they have failed previous incontinence procedure and if you do it correctly the overall long term cure rate can be around 85 to 90% now uh, pubic vaginal slings have been found to be as effective as retropubic slings but they say that there are more storage symptoms now what do they say they say that if you put a pubic vaginal sling there's more chance of obstruction but what i find in my own practice is that if you put in the right patient those patients who have a very weak sphincter those patients you anyway have to put it tight so they don't have obstruction symptoms you will have more obstruction patients if you have put it too tight in a patient who does not have sphincter issues so over time you learn how much tight to put right uh, so bladder next things is uh, are the autologous fascia slings right so clearly if you look at the evidence european guidelines clearly state that autologous fascia sling is more effective than burst corpus suspension okay but they are associated with more voiding dysfunction issues right but you have to choose the patient correctly don't put in a autologous fascia a tight in those who don't need it to be tight right next comes the tbt and the tot now let's not look at tbt and tot let's call it retropubic and transoperator why because multiple companies have come out with different different names so tbt of, uh, of jnj is retropubic and tbt o of jnj is op transoperator so it's confusing so don't we will not talk about tbt and tbt tot we'll talk about retropubic and transoperator slings okay now both the retropubic and transoperator sling lie mid urethrally and what do they do they are actually uh, uh, um, um, they, they are actually supplanting the support given by the pubo urethral ligament right at the mid part of the urethra you're going to put the two slings tension free meaning you're going to leave a little bit of space between the urethra and the sling you're going to be tension free why is that because you're not supposed to cause obstruction at rest only when the patient laughs coughs sneezes or sneezes or does any physical activity that leads to increase abdominal pressure you want the sling to cause dynamic compression at the mid urethra now it is very very clear take home message till the after 8 years it has been clearly shown that retropubic is more durable than transoperator okay so retropubic has been found to have higher objective patient reported cure rate at 8 year point please understand okay very clear so if i have a younger woman i will put in a retropubic sling i will not put in a transoperator because also because the evidence is not available that long right um or retropubic that is uh, has long term evidence right so there's 11 year evidence for retropubic the 17 year evidence same group of women were followed up for 17 years 19 90 women we and it's the state is high 90% objectively continent but one thing i want to ask you when you look at all the papers they keep saying retropubic is equivalent to transoperator that is what you will read in the conclusion plus please understand all these papers have excluded mixed incontinence and isd so please read the fine print most papers exclude mixed incontinence isd when you exclude mixed incontinence isd retropubic is equivalent to transoperator even in the long term study for retropubic they have excluded isd and mixed incontinence so that's the thing in isd which is a very special category of patients which we see a lot in our clinic remember transoperator should never be put the reoperation rates are very high it's almost double okay so please understand in isd patients intrinsic sphincter deficiency patients always do a retropubic sling and not a transoperator sling now transoperator is of two types outside in and inside out if i have time i will show you surgical surgeries but lack of time right so i have i have five 10 minutes more but i will try and show you surgeries also outside in inside out right now outside in and inside out are equivalent in results but when we talk about outside in i like them better than inside out why is that now in transoperator sling you go in outside in you go from the groin and come out through the vagina that means you are 
having the groin point of entry under control. In inside out, you're going from the vagina, coming out from the groin. Now in that, I don't have the groin point of exit under my control, you know, that much. So groin pain is a huge issue. Okay. Uh, when you use meshes for transverse sling, which go from end to end, all the way mesh, you may have, you can have groin pain. And if you have a patient of groin pain, there'll be a friend for life. Uh, 10 to 15 percent patients can have groin pain. Most of them recover, but there'll be a two to three percent who will be really a friend for life, right? Groin pain can be really bad, and it's worse in patients who have got inside out, because in the where come out in the groin is not under your control. Okay, that's one thing to remember. And mesh-related complications are higher in transoperative than retropubic, and dyspareunia, so sexual uh, uh, I mean pain is more in transoperative, obviously, because the mesh is lying horizontally. Right? So in garden variety SUI, both approaches are similar, but in uh, ISD, I will do retropubic. Right? Now they say complication of retropubic is much more because you will go through the bladder. Right? See, I, I mean, as urogynes, we're very used to perforating the bladder. I mean, you can perforate the bladder twice uh, and nothing will go wrong. Right? Uh, I mean, I didn't mean uh, while doing this, we're, all, we're used to opening the bladder. So bladder is actually a very forgiving organ. Right? It's an extremely forgiving organ, it's even more forgiving than our gynec organs. Seriously. So if you perfect it even twice, it's fine, right? So if you perfect three times, it's not fine. But if you follow the right technique, the perforation levels actually go lower. The thing about uh, retropubic is and transfer is that it's easy to put in a transoperator. Removal of a transoperator is very, very hard. Why is that? Because if you look at where the transoperator goes, if you see the direction transoperator, look at where it goes, right? It's coming out from the adductor medius, brevis. This is a part of the body none of us knows anything about. The orthopedic people don't know, the urologists don't know, the urogynes don't know, the gynecs don't know. So removing a transoperative sling is harder. Why? Because when you go to the, the, the transoperative sling, it's easy to remove the vaginal part, but the mesh tends to fuse to the pubic bone. So to remove the thigh part, you would actually go to the thigh. I have a case in August actually. There's a patient in whom a regular Indian made mesh was put in. Be very, very careful what kind of mesh you're using. Because we're using a microporous mesh, and some Indian made meshes are microporous, what will happen is that infection can go through, but lymphocytes and macrophages will not be able to go through the pores. Bacteria can go through, but the lymphocytes and macrophages cannot go through the pores. And then there can be in encapsulation of the infection. So I've got a patient who somebody else had put a sling six months ago, and the entire thing is encapsulated and infected. I have to remove the mesh in August. It's a nightmare. Look, I'm looking forward to I've already done three cases like this, and it's not easy. Right? So please remember, putting in a transferred is easy, removing is not that easy. Whereas retropubic area, we all know, uh, we all do Bursch. So, you know, I mean, that area we are familiar with, the retropubic space. Okay. So do you do TOD in all patients? No, you have to individualize. So younger women, ISD women, I will do retropubic. Older women, I may consider red trans operator. If I'm doing concomitant prolapse surgery with sling surgery, I would rather do retropubic because my ultrasound work has clearly shown retropubic sling tends to stay in place more often, right? So always choose the right patient. Both slings will work beautifully for you, right? Now, how about the new mini slings? Uh, be very, very careful. Uh, the, the mini slings have not really come to Indian market that much. But remember that, what do you mean by single incision slings? Now, these are the slings which are uh, like, see, in, if you look at TOT, trans operator, they have two incision points in the vagina and the groin. Whereas single incision slings have only one incision in the vagina and the other part hitches in the operator membrane. Now, the issue is that the, all of these slings have different, different fixation mechanisms. So just because there's evidence for one fixation mechanism does not think that there's an evidence for other fixation mechanism. Be careful, right? Um, now, there's a new, there's another sling called TVT Abrivo. Uh, it's a very good one. TBT Abrivo improves upon transoperator sling. How? Uh, TBT Abrivo actually is a transoperator sling. But the only difference is that because there's a groin pain chance, the, what they have done is that they have kept the mesh smaller, shorter, and the ends are proline stitches. So what happens is only proline stitches go through the operator membrane and operator muscle. Okay. And so uh, pain is lesser, right? So the success rates are pretty high. So you can use TBT Abrivo instead of transmitter uh, uh, um, tape, which is going to mesh all the way through. Yeah. Now, laser, 
lastly i'm going to finish in last points laser is not useful there's evidence coming out that even in moderate sui it's not useful and in mild and moderate sui my biofeedback works beautifully so why would i do laser right so be very careful about using laser it's industry driven uh biofeedback is absolutely non invasive whereas laser is invasive i have seen in us in my training patient coming with indiscriminate laser being used and vaginal stenosis because of that so be very careful right so only when evidence comes out saying it's great then you can go ahead and use it fda has come out saying that be careful about unsubstantiated unsubstantiated uh, stated uh, advertising okay mixed incontinence again uh, reoperation rates are higher in transoperative group okay uh, so be careful in older women i might put transoperative younger women i would rather put retropubic okay recurrent sui do not put transoperative either put retropubic or that a next link the pubo vaginal link i spoke to you about okay so do we have time to show videos or no time so i can i show videos yes, yes ma'am yeah yeah ma'am we would love to hear yeah 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 so basically i have two videos so just to show you i'm showing you a simple outside in video of a transoperative sling okay now see outside in so basically how do you do the marking you have the patient lithotomy and then you have the uh, when the patient lithotomy you will feel the ulterior longus then next time lithotomy feel the ulterior longus tendon you'll feel a very tough tendon there now mark on the groin fold just beneath the where the tendon uh, ends see my finger there it's basically where the groin uh, tendon ended you can feel that give way tendon is very tough right now this is a point of entry right but i will not enter there because if you enter in the groin fold it can be painful for the patient so you will take an incision medial to the groin fold can you see the line there that's where you enter and then you go laterally after you gone through the skin okay so basically and i'm showing you the earlier monarch okay when the incision is long so okay this is how it goes you have the obturator canal which is superior lateral you want to avoid that that's why the position i showed you is very safe that's a safe entry zone of monarch or yeah, any outside in mesh all of them have uh, followed the monarch sling though monarch is no more available in the market okay so what do we do we going to mark out a little longus okay and this is the direction right and literally it's at, at the level of clitoris but i would not follow the clitoris we just showing you that it's almost at the level of clitoris but that's the point where the little longer tendon is ended okay and that's a groin fold okay we just marking out but you can feel the give way okay this is your point of entry okay and that's the direction of your needles okay okay and then i'm going to hold the vestigial folds now here the incision is very big we don't take such big incisions now it's evolved over time right so you would take mid laterally uh the incision in transfer is little bigger than the retropubic but i would not go beyond 1.6 cm here you almost say 2 cm never go big incision because the sling tends to shift then okay but it's evolved over time here there's more finger resection now we only do uh, you know uh, sharp uh, uh, you know dissection with mesen bomb or stilis See now, I told you right. You don't go through the groin fold. In uh, you go medial to the groin fold. So we uh, put in lidocaine and adrenaline there. Then take an incision. As I said, don't take as big an incision. I'm going to show you here. It's mid lateral. Earlier, if you would do very big. This is the time when Monarch actually came. This is from Cleveland Clinic, and that time Monarch had just been. We 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 were actually, you know, testing out Monarch at that point in time. Right, you. and you dissect you will carry for the sharp dissection all the way to pubic membrane uh, per, uh, perineal membrane don't do finger dissection though we are going to show you finger dissection here okay but remember the incision in uh, transverted is always bigger than the one in retropubic and you're going to go all the way to the perineal membrane either side i'm going to fast forward it a little bit in a short video okay and then you put your finger there and then you look at the way we are going to hold her and you can feel the pubic bone on either side okay now see the ha now incision is medial to the groin fold marking 
because you don't want to go through the groin fold. Otherwise, it will be painful for the patient. Mesh can't go through the groin fold because it's a fold, right? Painful. So go medial to it. And then this is the direction of the needles. All needles outside him will go in this direction. Okay. And all of them have copied Monarch, but be careful. Some of them have la larger curves. So be careful. So then when you go inside, see, this is the way. Look at this. This is very important. Okay. You got a finger in the vagina and your thumb will be on the needle. And you're going to go in perpendicularly until you hear two clicks. You're going to go through the obturator membrane muscle and then turn. Okay. So you can actually see the clicks. Okay. Now just see how it goes. Okay. You will go perpendicularly in to see how it goes. Okay. Now they push it in perpendicularly and you will feel two clicks. See this. Okay. See this. Go through the skin and then go laterally. Okay. See this. Go through the skin and then go laterally. See laterally and then through the groin fold beneath the skin. Two clicks you will hear. You will feel the giveaway. See. One more and then turn. You could feel, see the giveaway, right? And then when you turn, it comes beautifully through the vagina incision. Right? And then different meshes have different fixation mechanisms. And then you bring it out. And you go in the same curve as you bring it out. Okay? You pull it out in the same direction. Same thing you'll do on the other side. Okay? And then don't worry about these markings. All of these meshes come with their own techniques. What you need to know is the principles of doing this, right? So basically, uh, Mona came with this play point where you cut out. And remember one thing, Mona had a plastic around it. Many of the meshes don't have plastic. When they don't have plastic, be careful about the friability. They should not be traumatic. Many Indian meshes are traumatic. They shear through the tissue. There's a, uh, there's a, uh, I use a CL medical eye stop. Um, uh, which is absolutely, which is not covered plastic, but which is very nice, fine material, doesn't shear the tissue. Okay. Okay. Now, once we've done that, you will hold the plastic where plastic is available and then tension it. So, okay, but how do you tension it? Right. Now, tension should be perpendicular. Okay. It should not be parallel to the urethra. Okay. Very importantly, because tension free. And now, tensioning now, here you're going to see uh, scissor being used. I like to use Kelly's. Use one thing that you're comfortable with. We used to use scissor earlier. Now we do Kelly's and now we go all the way to the break of the scissor. Okay. Don't, don't use it only the tip. In this patient, we want to make it tighter, but we don't want to make it normally tighter. Go to the break of the instrument. Okay. Put the instrument perpendicularly down. But look at the direction of the instrument. It's perpendicularly down. Right. And go through the break. Okay. Go through here. And then tighten the, I mean, pull on both sides so that the sling is uh, approximately tension free. And then remove the plastic. Okay. And then you. Uh, we'll close the incision with two zero vitals which just interrupted. Okay. And then cut the mesh. Okay. Do I have time to show uh, TBT retrobubic? I don't think so. It's a big lecture. So I can't hear you, Ruchika. Okay. TV, TVT also, ma'am, you show, please. Okay. That's so the lecture. Will you be something that I use. So when I was in Cleveland Clinic, we had the eye stock mesh there. It's a French made mesh, excellent mesh. Excellent, excellent. Uh, now the J&J &J one is not available. So uh, luckily when I was coming back from Cleveland Clinic, I told them you have to come to India and they are in India and it's cheaper. It's the best mesh. The good thing about the eye stock mesh is that's non-deformable. See, if you look at multiple meshes, you should go back and see when you pull it, okay? If it gets pulled and stays pulled, it's not good. You want to use a non-deformable mesh because when you use a non-deformable mesh, what happens is it remains tensioned how much you tension. If a mesh tends to get distorted, then it can become tight over time, right? So be careful. Okay, now the eye stop mesh, right? You see, I look at the eye stop mesh, doesn't have plastic, but look at the pore size, so important. And look at the edge. The edge is very nice. It's not friable. It's not traumatic. And the pore size is very good. You want the pore size to be good enough that even if infection goes through, bacteria go through, lymphocyte macrophages can go through the uh, pore, right? So always use a polypropylene type 1 macroporous mesh. Very, 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 very important. I'm going to show you a case where I'm doing both. Uh, I'm going to show bladder neck sling. And because I've already shown you mid urethral tensioning, right? So the tensioning in retropubic is similar. Okay, we'll do it retropubically. But I'm going to show you how we do it in bladder neck here, okay? So that it combines into one. 
But remember, though I'm showing you blood and neck here, I put in patients who don't have IS, even with ISD, I put in mid I I tend to understand which to put where, but mostly normal hypermobile urethra, you would put in a mid urethra, retrobibic sling, okay? And tension, like I showed you in the uh, TOT case. Tensioning is the same, whether TOT or retropubic. Okay, now it's, it's bladder neck. Um, uh, again, infiltration, I'm going to go fast, fast. Infiltrate nicely. Okay, incision, this incision is more the bladder neck, right? Because, and then you will do the same thing I showed you, right? And this is a small, so around 1.6 centimeters what the incision I take, okay? And then you will, in size, you will dissect till the, uh, till the perineal membrane, which I showed you already how to dissect. Okay, it's all the way to the perineal membrane. Okay, we normally take 1.6, not half. And then in bladder neck slings, there's a uh, tendency to, there, there's a technique of, I mean, earlier, there was by, by convention, you put a stretch of bladder neck, right? Uh, but you don't need to. You can feel the bladder neck. Okay, what I'm showing you more importantly is the direction. How will you go? Okay, now see the thing. This is how it's going to go. Okay, now you can, I don't have time. There are multiple techniques, but you understand this particular technique. You're going to put your finger in the uh, incision and go with, uh, go in this uh, double same side shoulder. And once you cross the perineal membrane, drop it. Okay. And you'll come out uh, through marking two semi lateral to the midline, two finger lateral to midline. Okay. Just at the level where the pubic bone ends. Okay. So basically, this is going to be two finger lateral to the midline, just above the pubic bone. Okay. And once you do that, you're going to do scopy. Why are you going to do scopy? Because you want to be sure you're not perforated. Like I said, I mean, when you do it correctly, when you go to the same side shoulder and drop and come out, it comes out really nicely through the marking and you don't perforate. Even if you perforate once or twice, it's fine. Just that you have to catheterize for a little longer. I found it even if you perfect once and the catheter remains for only 24 hours, it's fine. That is such a forgiving organ. Okay. So you're going to do scopy nicely um, to see whether any perforation, if there's no perforation, then you will attach the mesh and you tension. And tension is going to be like I showed you. I'm going to rush to the TV because there's another technique of doing retro pubic also. Some other time I will teach you that. But for now, this is okay. Okay, then tensioning. Okay, now the degree of tensioning depends upon the degree of sphincter deficiency, right? So when when there's a severe ISD, I we tension really tight. Okay, one more, one last thing before we end is that yeah, yeah. One, one last thing I want to say is it's a misnomer that you need scopy in transoperative. Please, please, please always end a transoperative surgery with scopy because you could perforate a urethra. Okay, be careful. Always do scopy whether you're doing transfer or retrospective. Okay? Yeah, bye for now. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Aborna Hege. You are such a good teacher. Uh, I would like to invite comments from the Minakshi Auja ma'am and Komal ma'am. Dr. Aruna, are you there? Yeah, ma'am. I'm here. Yeah. So, concluding remarks. Yes, I think Aparna's talk was just wonderful with practical uh, procedures and and the, you have told us the tips and tricks how to go about and do it successfully. So it was lovely, Aparna. Thank you so much. You are the master in the field and whenever you talk, we know it is the right way to do. So Thank you. It was Thank great. I saw Dr. Minakshi Ahuja also. She was there, joined in. So Dr. Aruna. Yes, ma'am. Good evening, yes. ma'am. Uh, good evening, good evening. Ma'am, it, yes. yeah, it was it is it was very sweet even though lengthy it was very knowledgeable talk ma'am sorry i just want to ask one thing uh, do do you prefer any uh, particular surgeries especially in obese patients ma'am no so obese no uh, no matter how obese they are uh, that particular area the obesity doesn't really come in the way you know especially in retropubic slings yes, okay uh, I will base it on the degree of sphincter deficiency. I will base it upon one more thing. I didn't have time to show it, but I do a lot of ultrasound work, right? 
So yeah. I can actually see when a mesh is lying after I finish the sling surgery. I mean, after like post op and all, right? So in uh, the mesh in transamperial tends to shift proximally because of their weight lies. You know, it's yeah. like horizontal, right? It can shift proximal. Mm-hmm. I really want that the sling remains mid retinal. So I'm very careful that if I don't have the markings correctly, right? I would rather do a retropubic than the transamperial one. But it doesn't matter. Older women, you can put a transamperial sling. Okay. But be careful, rule out ISD. Intrinsic yes, to the never put DOT. Yeah. Okay. I one just want thing. to uh, 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 one more thing, ma'am. Uh, do you prefer combining these surgeries with any other surgeries or it's only sling surgery or whatever uh, surgeries? No, no. I will uh, I will look for in prolapse patients, I always look out for occult SUI. Often prolapse patients have hidden SUI. Why? Mm-hmm. Because prolapse kinks the urethra. Some patients mm-hmm. will come with SUI predom- along with prolapse. I will do concomitant surgery. Mm-hmm. But if they come with prolapse alone and no leaking history, I will actually look out for occult SUI because sometimes the prolapse kinks the urethra and you can't see it. I will elicit it. And then mm-hmm. I'll give a choice to the woman. Do you want to do prolapse surgery alone or do you want to do it concomitantly with SUI surgery? Right? And anyway, both prolapse and SUI need to do biofeedback therapy. That is universal for me. But when I do SUI and prolapse surgery, I will put in the sling first, mm-hmm. but not tension it. I will do the prolapse surgery, suspend the apex, and then tension the sling. You know, okay. because I don't want to get this location distorted. So be very okay. careful. I like to do retropubic in prolapse surgeries because of the fact that retropubic tends to stay in place more often. I am very anal about putting it mid Okay. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you. Ma'am, is, is there any yeah. role of drug in case of SUI? You have just mentioned that duloxetine. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you may, see, duloxetine can be given and it's helpful. A couple of months, I don't like to give it for longer. It does have side effects. It works by increasing glutamine. Mm-hmm. There are no other drugs. Yes, you can give a little bit of amitriptyline in patients with mixed incontinence because amitriptyline acts in the bladder neck. It also acts in the bladder. Uh, so, it's got a, some role in mixed incontinence. But overall, other than that, other than... SNRIs, uh, there's no drugs out there, right? On SUI. Okay. E- e- even on clean, of course. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, madam. So uh, it was a very, very informative lecture. So we now move on to the next session. And Dr. Komal Chavan is going to speak on u- urinary tract infections in pregnancy. So we have Dr. Anupam Gupta. He is the past vice president of Foxy and is also currently the president of Isoparb of Agra. Welcome, sir. Next, we have Dr. Anita Sabharwal, madam, with us. She's the recipient of Foxy Champion, Wonder Foxy and Dheera Award. And she is the president of South Gynecologist Forum of Delhi. And she was also the chairperson of uh, ISCCP Public Awareness Committee and past chairperson Adolescent Health Committee an executive of Narchi. So we have so much esteemed uh, teachers with us. Welcome Dr. Anita Sabharwal, madam. We have P. Pallavi with us. She is professor and head Mahatma Gandhi Medical College and Research Institute, Sri Balaji Vidya Pete Pondicherry. And she is a great teacher. So welcome Dr. P. Pallavi. She is also a research fellow. So I invite uh, Anita Sabarwal, madam, to kindly introduce Dr. Komal, madam, for her talk. Thank you, Dr. Ruchika, for the wonderful introduction. And uh, especially now you've given me the very fine duty to introduce Dr. Komal, Niranjan Chavan, because I know her so well, you know. I initially knew them from our Facebook. Uh, I knew her husband first, and then she's such a wonderful person. She is, and you know, actions speak louder than words uh, because gaining knowledge is first step to wisdom, but sharing knowledge is the first step to humanity. And also we can say uh, sharing knowledge is also the most fundamental act of friendship because you give something without losing something. So this is what she's been doing for the past, I can see so many years now. So uh, she's the medical director, Chavan Maternity and Nursing Home. And a very, very well decorated person with a lot of, uh, I think, a uh, lot, lot of, uh, she has uh, credits to her. And she is the national trainer for Foxy Dhira, national expert for Foxy UNICEF, and member managing council of MOGS. 
and senior consultant dnb teacher also so she's a teacher as well as a very good orator and she's going to speak on a very very common and very important subject that is uti which all of us must learn from her so i request dr komal to kindly go on with her wonderful lecture thank you thank you so much dr anita ji i think i'm i'm really fond of her she brings uh, you know like the flowers and the beauty so uh, <laughs> when we see her we always feel very cool and distresses her us so that is how she is and really like to see her updates and whenever she is there it is always a happy mood around so thank you anita ji and uh, thank you uh, 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 i think dr anupam gupta sir also had joined in between i saw him and dr pallavi so all the chair was much and we had lovely talks by aparna and we had lovely talks by our uh, uh, jb sharma i think both the talks was so good and uh, very very apt and they were so practical these talks you know the talk which uh, dr jb sharma and aparna it was more of a surgical aspects and what i am going to talk more uh, is about a common condition we see day in and day out in our opd we have so many uh, patients who are coming with this complaint they come with urinary tract infection maybe a very common thing in our opd and we really need to know uh, when we try to investigate some patients get recurrent infections and that is how we always feel what we should do so i felt the episode of urogynecology will not end if we don't complete the management of uti Be, though being very common but very practical and that was the idea of introducing this short talk and thank you for your kind introduction i'll go with the quote the secret of getting ahead is getting started and with that we know we start with up to this topic about the uti and what are the factors which affect you know these are what we are going to talk the socio economic burden the prevalence what is infection colonization contamination what is uncomplicated what is complicated what is persistent and recurrent uti asymptomatic bacteria whether to treat what to do imaging and reference so this is the overview of today's talk and uti as we all know it is a microbial pathogen within the urinary tract whether it is urethra bladder or kidney and most common uti the infection is bladder so it is a cystitis wherein we see a frequency urgency dysuria hematuria and suprapubic pain usually an ascending variety of infection what we see in our female patients because of from the infection from perianal and peri vaginal region and we always say that urinary tract infections are more common in women than in male shorter urethra opens near to vagina pregnancy is a condition which reduces the immunity chances of uti in pregnancy are high there is easy contamination which we so and the hormonal changes seen at that cycle so definitely we have a increased load of uti cases than the male patients which come to the opd so most common is infection you know almost 50 to 60% will experience this infection and re- it becomes recurrent if there are two episode in 6 months and or more than three in the past 12 months so this is very very important to know whether it is a recurrent or no so asymptomatic infection is when a bacteria or fungus strain cannot be uh, can be isolated in appropriate quantity but you know the patient may, may be not having any uh, symptom about U- uti so such cases if if it is there normally you know we it is not actually required to treat them aggressively where we need to asymptomatic bacteria why because if treat left untreated it may progress to lower urinary tract can reach the kidneys because pyelonephritis and affect the pregnant mother and the pregnancy can get complicated there can be higher incidence even of low birth weight so everything in the pregnancy there can be fever and this is going to further complicate and a morbidity in the pregnancy will increase so definitely we need to look for the signs in a uti there are the fever more than 100 increased frequency urination 
dyskinesia supra pubic pain which we said and pyuria uh, and the classical test which we do is a microscopy to know but a culture and a sensitivity is really really required the midstream urine sample needs to be taken in a container then for culture and if culture is positive and do a sensitivity te test and uh, believe me we need to uh, insist on a patient that they collect the midstream sample without contaminating the vagina the surrounding skin because that is going to introduce and get a contaminated sample so actually when do you do culture because you feel that the patient is in a compromise or pregnancy if there is a uti get a culture done recent expo uh, exposure to antibiotics we have already given antibiotics patient has not got benefited recurrent infection advanced age or there is a catheterization or any instrumentation definitely don't treat just empirically do a culture and treat culture specific so on culture what we see if you see more than 1000 polyp forming unit it is usually goes in favor of cystitis 10000 it goes in pyelonephritis and when we see uh, more than 1 lakh it is an asymptomatic bacteria so this is how uh, we will see and we will i try to isolate the and culture the bacteria which is there so we need to when we trying to report the urine sample we need to be familiar with this terms contamination that is the organism are introduced while collecting urine so this, this is not it's a contaminated sample so you discard it and ask for a fresh sample here there are no health concerns then comes colonization organisms are present in the urine but are causing no illness or symptom it is kind of an asymptomatic infection so here we need to just observe the patient but infection is a combination of pathogens within the urinary symptoms with symptoms and inflammatory response so this infection requires treatment then coming to the uncomplicated and complicated variety uncomplicated is a healthy patient anatomically no problem functionally no problem everything so this is a healthy patient but complicated is when the patient has any organic pathology here we have an increased risk of colonization and we will not have our therapies working here we can find an anatomical uh, disturbances like it can be a, a diverticuli or a urine stone or a bladder problem or a prolapse or a huge prolapse uh, 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 in a immunocompromised patient in a drug resistant patient patient this becomes an a complicated uti so complicated infections we see commonly as acute cystitis in a non pregnant patient so it can be in preg pregnancy it can be in perimenopausal age group or even a young uh, post pubertal we see an uncomplicated where this patient will come with a history of a sexual intercourse and there is a delayed post coital bladder emptying and they get this infections repeatedly even use of diaphragm or spermicidal contraceptives they alter the normal vaginal flora and allow uh, colonization so these are the examples of an uncomplicated infection and a complicated infection we have already spoken uh, in of uh, complicated patients like any organic problem so we need to diagnose that secondly we need to diagnose what is the recurrent uti reinfection and persistent uti so recurrent uti is occurs after documented infection has resolved so you know patient uh, there is an infection which has documented it has resolved completely and she comes back again it is a recurrent but reinfection a new event with reintroduction of uh, bacteria into the urinary tract so reinfection is a reinfection with the same bacteria but again a, a new event and a persistent is the same bacteria which has persisted it has there is no relief but the infection is just persisting so that is a persistent infection so we we, we really are important because accordingly we need to give the duration of antibiotic for when we get these kind of infections so uh, perimenopausal post menopausal we have spoken about the organic causes diabetes the incontinence overactive bladder everything whatever we spoke today and uh, these are the hygiene practice from the crux of everything we always tell the patients to be hygienic uh, menopausal patient because of atrophic vaginitis because of the raised posterior uh, urethral wall because of due to voiding dysfunction which was discussed earlier so all these are the risk factors to get uti and uti is going to definitely have its implication and the bacteria is going to colonize with all these factors what we have discussed and it is going to get complicated 
And when it is getting complicated, we know the pathogens, we need to isolate and send a culture. And we need to check that these are the common cells, Lactobacillus, Staphylococcus, Streptococcus, they are the common cells. But pathogens are our E. coli, E. coli almost 80%. Then comes Klebsiella, Pseudomonas, Staphylococcus, Enterococcus. So why, why pregnancy, it is more common? Why? Because the kidney size increases approximately 1.5%. There is a dilatation of the pelvic lysol system. So you can see it, giving a picture of an hydrotephlosis. Also, there is increase in the GFR and the renal flow rate. So these are the physiological changes which occur. Also, the growing uterus will compress and displace the uterus ureter laterally at the pelvic brain. There can be a hydroureter-like thing which, is, which can be seen because of the progesterone effect also. And it can also cause thinking of the urethra and lending of the urethra which is common. So physiological changes do aid and aggravate the infection which is and this pregnant patient become more prone to urinary tract infection. Also due to persistent pressure of the gravid uterus there is marked thickening of the bladder at trigon. You can see it is thickened. This also increases the bladder pressure from 8 to 20 centimeters of water and due to the reason there is significant Vasico urethral reflex causing ascending infections. See, that is a urinary infection. So we are worried in our pregnant patients who have high chances of urinary tract infection. So we need to test it. We need to identify whether it is a reinfection, whether it is occurring, uh, uh, occurring again and again in pregnancy. Each episode needs to be treated se separately. We need to give antibiotics to this patient and we need to check whether it is getting recurrent or no. And if recurrent, definitely the patients who are non-pregnant can receive a prophylaxis for 6 to 12 months. Nitrofluorantine is a best drug which can be given to these patients. So when we talk, we, when there is a persistent infection, failure to completely eradicate, we need to really go and check if there is added anatomical cause because we don't want to prolong the therapy because you cannot keep giving antibiotics, but you need to then re-inspect, examine the patient and find out why our antibiotics are not acting. So when we uh, talk about the 80% E. coli, we need to check the vaginal flora also, restore the flora, hydrate the patient and prevent reinfection. So when we talk about reinfection or a recurrent infection, that after two weeks, we really need to repeat a culture and verify whether the infection has gone completely or no. If the infection has gone completely, then we know that this UTI is treated and again if it comes back, it becomes a recurrent UTI. So why is the E. coli very common in intestine and why it is always causes this complicated variety of UTI? The answer lies in biofilm. Biofilm, this is the E. coli forms a biofilm, a slimy layer on the bladder surface which increases its adhesiveness and offer resistance to antibiotic penetration. And this makes the antibiotic action very, very weak. So this, how the biofilm formation is the cause for having recurrent, recurrent UTI in such patients. And when we know these biofilms are there, we patients also can have an interstitial bladder pain syndrome and the infection can remain a uh, lot of, for a longer time, even if the cultures become negative. So it is like a persistent infection which remains. And you may not get a positive culture also, but patient may be symptomatic within this condition. So the therapies, we know hydration. We tell our patients to drink a lot of water. We need to relieve the urinary tract obstruction at whatever level it is. If a foreign body or a catheter which is there present needs to be removed because we need to treat the cause and remove it and judicious use of antibiotics because you need, need not start just empirically any antibiotic, but use it, all antibiotics with caution. This is the examination finding, which I had told you earlier, do a proper urine test, urine routine microscopy will tell you the leukocytes, epithelial cell, even there are RBCs, everything will be uh, uh, evident on a routine microscopy. And we need to even do diabetic screening because these patients are having immunocompromised and raised sugars, they have frequent urinary tract infections. So diabetic control is very, very important when we're talking about reinfection and relapse. 
So this is the classification and the criteria for labeling uh, UTI as per the American uh, uh, urology, uh, European, Canadian, you know, and uh, almost all have said that presence of this urea, foul smelling pain and hematuria and a fever, so they have classified as a, uh, as a UTI and American uh, Urology Association has said only a dysuria, hematuria and uh, smell and pain. So by any definition, these are the definitions. And this is when, when it becomes a recurrent because it occurs after a documented infection is resolved. And the European chase at least three episodes in the last two months. So that is how all the guidelines are comparison of all the guidelines which is there. So empirical treatment is allowed only if there is the same organism as per the American College. And most of the guidelines do not allow in complicated variety the, uh, the uh, empirical treatment with antibiotics and culture becomes a must and this is the anatomical problems the voiding dysfunction the bladder outflow tract and every and all needs to be kept in mind so midstream sample which we said but if there is persistent hematuria we really need to do a renal imaging need to do a cystoscopy in this patient prophylaxis whoever require we need to uh, check on this because we just can't keep giving uh, prophylaxis, but we need to keep repeating the culture also. Then the culture becomes negative. And to the patients who get recurrent uh, uh, infections, post coital antibiotics, they are the low dose for prophylaxis, which we can continue and tell them that take it after the intercourse. And this is going to help from the post uh, uh, coital urinary tract infection. The resistant infections, recurrence, Non-pharmacological intervention and pharmacological because we really don't want to keep the patient continuously on drugs. So what uh, what are the recommendations saying the American, European, and the Canadian? They're saying vaginal douching, tampons, pomizidal, all the thing is recommended. They are not going to prevent. But in a menopausal patient, systemic, uh, systemic HRT, low-dose estrogen, or a role of probiotics, or a cranberry, d manos low-dose antibiotic prophylaxis, so all uh, this is there, but what is most recommended is the estrogen therapy and the supplement with D-manos and postcoital antibiotics. So these are something which are recommended for the recurrent uh, UTI. Uh, this is what is there. And how do you give the vaginal estrogen? By a cream form, daily for two weeks and twice weekly for six to eight months. And this, the, this is what we can recommend. No recommendation of vaginal washes or long-term use of just only probiotic, but in conjunction we can give. We need to avoid chlorofluorinols. Definitely choice becomes a nitrofluorantine. Safe, uh, first line we can start at 50 to 100 mg dose. And that there is a role of phosphomycin. This is a newer drug. And we need to know that this drug, given 100 mg BD for seven days, uh, or maximum three gram, uh, this is the nitrofluorantine dose and three gram per day single dose, this is the phosphomycin dose, we can give it, and it can be a first line treatment also in uncomplicated lower urinary tract infection. Avoid beta lactamins and criminals. So that is the message which all guidelines, even the European, the Infectious Disease Society of America, the European Society of Clinical Microbiology, Urological Association, all are in favor of not giving empirical antibiotics, but giving culture specific and phosphomycin can be given the three gram oral sachet. It should be taken on an empty stomach two to three hours before or two to three hours after meals, preferably at bedtime and after emptying the bladder. You know, you need to keep the concentration in the bladder and not to void immediately. So empty the bladder, then give the sachet and we need to make the preparation in 200 ml of water and drink it immediately. And this is uh, which is uh, the treatment, a newer treatment for recurrent urinary tract infection and also can be given for uncomplicated variety also. So uh, asymptomatic, we have said, does not require a treatment, but we need to know if there is any immunocompromised status or high risk factor. But prophylaxis, uh, you need, need to give all women with pre-pregnancy history of UTI, persistent symptomatic or asymptomatic bacteria after two courses of antibiotics, then, uh, sorry, I am going. Two courses of antibiotics and even after one UTI, if other risk factors are there like diabetes or uh, the patient is having an immunocompromised status and we can give prophylaxis post-coital. 
सो यूज नाइट्रोफ्लोरेंटाइन फॉसोमाइसिन और कैफेलैक्सिन ओनली ओनली इफ इंडिकेटेड एंड वी नीड टू नो कैटेगराइज द यूरिनरी ट्रैक इन्फेक्शन इन शॉर्ट from pregnant and a non pregnant state but in the non pregnant state we need to find out whether the patient is post menopausal or peri menopausal so pre menopausal you need to find out whether there are structural abnormalities or no if there are structural abnormalities treat them and if there is post menopausal you can give vaginal estrogens yeah, we need to give low dose prophylaxis non pharmacological me measures like uh, starting post coital antibiotics imaging if there is a uh with uh, the urethral valve defect or you suspect any compression or anything this patient should resort to imaging so this is in short how we can go about systematically treating an urinary tract in pregnancy and out of pregnancy and i'll end with a quote whatever the mind of the man can conceive and believe it can achieve this is by napoleon hill and uh, at the end just a humble request to vote and support me for the post of vice president of coxing from the west zone i am your candidate i want to work along with you and and with you and together we can work for coxie and that is my uh, that is my goal and my vision and with that i end my talk and thank you all for your patience here so thank you komal ma'am so our blessings and wishes are with you you will surely come up with flying colors the result will come thank you thanks for so your talk yeah your talk was also informative very so i would like to invite people dr p pallavi madam to please uh, give the concluding remarks that was a wonderful talk dr komal and i must congratulate uh, dr komal as well as uh, dr ruchika for bringing this webinar on a very important topic uraganic often my students when they pass out from the post graduation they ask me madam in which field i should do my fellowship so they gave me only three options they ask whether infertility ultrasound or endoscopy i always tell them the other two options you should go for either urogynic or surgical oncology so we need to increase our expertise in this field so i uh, request dr komal as she is an active member of coxi to think about bringing uh, this uh, urogynic uh, training courses under the ambit of uh, coxi because i see only endoscopy and infertility yes. and uh, ultrasound under the uh, coxi training courses so if we can put uh, this course also i think there will be lot of uh, new uh, young uh, upcoming uh, ogicians who can be trained in this field and we have seen all the speakers and how we can make a great difference by uh, uh, treating this women who are suffering from all these uh, different problems of sli so that was a wonderful talk i have just one question madam uh, what is the role is there any Uh, role of vaccines for prevention of this recurrent uti vaccines no i am not heard of any vaccines per se so much literature uh, i have gone through but there is no role of any vaccines which vaccines are you talking about uh, no there are some literature of upcoming vaccines which are available in the uh, western world but i am not sure whether it has come to our country as of now yeah. so another thing i just wanted to know what uh, what are the regimen you have told for the starting the empirical treatment would you opt for a 3 day course or a 5 day course or a 7 day course because uh, there is always a great confusion regarding the length of the duration the gvs there is a confusion in the length of the duration if you feel that it is a completely a uh, non complicated patient and they get infection i think a 3 day is fine all almost all guidelines are mentioned a 3 day You, you you do not give it for a longer time but if a patient is getting a very long term then they, that are the cases where the long term course is uh, required so 3 days should be fine for the okay okay ma'am thank you anita ji thank you so much yeah. pallavi thank you so much for being there present it was lovely having you both chairing the session and great pleasure ruchika thank you thank you very much wonderful hearing you dr komal you really spoke so well on this very very important topic as ma'am dr palvi also said so much morbidity mortality can be prevented if we just look into it and prevention of uti at a very basic level by even giving them menstrual hygiene in detail yes. you know we just say menstrual hygiene we don't tell them how many pads to be changed in a day you know 
the last days of the cycles they are using one or two pads only yes. because if there is hardly any blood coming out so we have to really tell them in detail actually about these simple things not to hold the urine and drink lots of water because many of the girls are women are working now so in the offices they don't have problem they don't have problems you know so they are not able to go and pass urine or they are not uh -huh. able to drink water i'll give you i'll tell you about one patient she was a, from a very posh area in a greater class one she was in one complex you know very shopping complex very posh archana shopping complex and she was selling those uh, uh the suits and so she came to me imagine what she used to do they didn't have good toilets over there so she didn't want to go there so she used to keep pads to pass oh. the urine and uh, she came in such horrible situation you know after so many months of using because these are simple things you know and people don't even share these things with anybody so i i was really shocked when i just saw all this happening we have to oh, be really, very 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 uh, yeah so we have to be, yeah yeah so one has to be very very verbal loud in speaking about these small simple things which we think we presume everybody knows and uh, ultimately it comes to such so your topic was wonderful and you so clearly you told even phosphomycin is a wonderful drug yes. really helps people a lot and you have to just take once and it's really comfort though it's little expensive and yes. maybe now the rates are coming down so thank you so much and really wishing you all the best truly you are going to come out with the colorful the colors and you will be our vice president and we'll do lot of work together with you Okay, thank you. Thank you, Kumal, madam. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Chitta. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Chitta, for lovely coordinating. Great. Yeah, all this. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. Okay, bye. All the best. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Shield Connect team, Sahiti, Dr. Prachi. Yeah, thank you all.